To start, I suggest getting yourself a decent looking cutting board to build your charcuterie board on. For now, let's slap some bacon onto it. Cook your bacon in an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 to 18 minutes or until crispy. Feel free to use the power of the snap if you have that ability. Once it's cooked, chop all of it pretty finely and separate into two even piles. Throw one of those piles into a bowl along with one block of cream cheese. Season this up with a quarter teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of black pepper, a half teaspoon of granulated garlic, a quarter teaspoon of granulated onion, a half teaspoon of dried parsley, which is optional, and finally a quarter cup or one ounce of sharp cheddar. Mix this up by hand if the cream cheese is still cold, but if you let it hit room temperature, you can mix it up via rubber spatula. Just mash this together for a couple minutes, and once it's all combined, roll it into a ball. Once ballage has been achieved, spread out your chopped bacon and roll the ball around in it. You should have just enough to coat the whole thing, and it's just beautiful. The last step is to take some cling film and wrap the ball up. Then twist the plastic until it's tight and place it into the fridge for about an hour to stiffen up. Okay, charcuterie board 101 here. I want a focal point and the bacon cheese ball is mine. You can place it anywhere, but all eyes will lead to the first thing you place down. I put mine dead center, but going at any offset would look nice too. I like to highlight my focal point with other things. For this, I went with sliced bratwurst, but something like brisket or steak slices would be nice here too. I think every charcuterie I make has goat's cheese. Place this down anywhere along with a few pork rinds. These deli trios are delightful and also something I put on every charcuterie. There are plenty of things you can do with these meats, from the infinite spin to the rose or just laying it out flat are just a couple of the things I like to do. The rose looks particularly nice, but it's not the most practical because of the toothpick. I also enjoy a nice soft cheese like brie or camembert. A full wheel of brie always seems to be a bit much, so I'm gonna just go with half. Fancy ham will always make me happy to see on any meat and cheese tray. I just put this down in bunches and scatter randomly. It's one of those things you usually don't realize you picked up until you bite into it and you have the salty reminder that it's prosciutto. I wonder if I should make a joke about cutting the cheese. Nah. Finally, I'm gonna add some smoked cheddar. I enjoy smoked cheese like this or smoked gouda paired with my spicy meats. Finish up by placing pork rinds anywhere you see fit. This turned out so nice and extravagant. I will be taking this to a party, but I do need to know how delicious this bacon and cheese ball turned out. And oh boy, did it delicify. Creamy, smoky, salty, and flavorful. You can add any more adjectives you'd like to in the comments. For this recipe, you're gonna have to make the critical decision of smoked sausage or hot dogs. I personally pick smoked sausage because hot dogs just aren't very good after the first one. I specifically chose Koneka Sausage for this. Dear Koneka Sausage Company, if you ever wanna sponsor a video, collaborate, or just show off your facility, please email me. It's in my about me section. Sincerely, one hungry boy. Now, if you're gonna use rope sausage like this, you can go with a few sizes. This is the old ding donger. It's a pretty aggressive move, but it'll allow anyone that's truly hungry to feel full. The next size down is gonna be our half chub. This is the size I think of when having pigs in a blanket for dinner. And finally, the bashful billy. Everyone has had those nasty little cocktail smokies covered in cheap biscuits before. Those are the best version for some reason, so I'll be making something similar. Cut your sausage to size and we can move on to our dough. For the dough, you'll need some eggs. Well, three to be exact. Set the other two aside for later purposes. To that, add in three ounces of ground pork rinds, and finally, three ounces of mozzarella cheese. Blend this on low for about two minutes or until a dough ball is formed. Perfect. Bring some parchment paper over to your workstation along with some butter. This dough is very sticky, so I'll be using the butter to help the dough glide off my hands. Take about one tablespoon of your dough and press it into an oval on your parchment paper. Now, lay your sausage or hot dog on top of it. Pick up your parchment paper and fold the dough to the other side. This dough does a great job at sealing, so you shouldn't have an issue with that. If there's any excess, just pull it off and put it into the next dough ball. Repeat this until all of your dough has been used up. I was able to get about 20 of these mini piggies. There's something about making finger foods like this that puts me into a deep trance. I only ever snap out of it when I'm on the last one. Now that we have all these wrapped up and ready to go, let's get it to shine with an egg wash. Simply crack an egg into a bowl and give it a pretty rigorous forking. If you have a brush, brush each one with a little bit of egg. If not, you could be a caveman alongside me and use your fingers to brush the egg on. When they're all egged up, place them into an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 to 12 minutes or until nicely golden brown. These turned out even better than I was expecting. I knew this dough would be a better fit than a wet batter, but adding a little bit of egg made it pop. If you're curious about the sauce on the side, don't be. I made it to dip these in, but even good chefs make mistakes. Which the sauce was a whole mistake. Sauce aside, these are really damn good. Good enough for me to suffer third degree mouth burns. Excuse me while I go cool my tongue off. See y'all next time. Hey there, my meaty friends. This is Reed, aka Carnivore Chef. 
I don't know about you, but sausage balls have always been a part of my family holidays for as long as I can remember. In fact, I think they're the first thing I remember cooking because nobody wants to sit around and make 500 of these tasty morsels by themselves. So if you're in the mood for a tasty treat, grab your ingredients and maybe some friends or family and start rolling up something delicious. To get started on this one, I suggest removing any watches and rolling up those sleeves because it will get a little messy. For this recipe, you'll need our good old friend ground pork rinds in the amount of three ounces. Eight ounces of sharp cheddar cheese. One pound of breakfast sausage. And two eggs. There's really no wrong way to do this. As long as you have your ingredients ready and some clean hands, you can start mixing and rolling. Literally just add your ingredients to a bowl and begin to mix. Just make sure you don't get any unwanted ingredients such as eggshell like I later found out that I had in mine. I suggest mixing and mashing by hand for about three to five minutes just to make sure everything is incorporated. It should look a little something like this when combined. Scrape off the excess hand dough back into the bowl and wash up. Grab yourself a standard size cookie sheet and rip off some parchment paper. Get it laid out and avoid the GoPro attached to it. If you want to help this along, dip your hands in water periodically to keep the dough from sticking. Now, just simply grab an amount of dough and roll them out. That's really it. It's just as easy as making meatballs, but the outcome is so much more special. Once you have all of your batter rolled out, throw your balls into an oven set to 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 22 minutes. You can absolutely cook them a bit longer if you want to. The longer they cook, the toastier the cheese on the outside will get. Once they're out, let them cool at room temp for about 10 minutes. Then set up an elaborate presentation and stack them up. Here's a little close-up of the inside texture. And this first bite is for my Patreon community. These are super tasty, rich and toasty. When they're made with flour, they're a little more toasty, but these still have a nice toasty quality about them. I think the most natural place to start making a breakfast bake would be to make some bacon. While you're doing something natural, go ahead and like this video and subscribe to the channel. Actually, I think eggs would be the hallmark to anything breakfasty but we want to make the excellent choice of not cooking those too early. Anyways, place one pound of bacon onto some foil or parchment paper and into an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 13 to 15 minutes. So when it comes to memory cards, files can corrupt. You know, corrupted like the long elaborate shot I did to tell you to take a bowl and add in four ounces of ground pork rinds, four eggs, and one teaspoon of baking powder into a bowl and mix. Mine were spicy as fuck. We cooked the bacon already, right? Oh, yeah, we did. Once it's cooled, take your bacon pan and pour in all of that savory, savory bacon grease into it. We're going to use it to fry up some eggs. You can use butter to fry up your eggs if you want to, but I think bacon grease is a much better option. To fry the basic egg, I suggest using some sort of nonstick pan or a very well-seasoned cast iron pan. Place it over medium heat with your grease and let that start to shimmer. Crack your egg into the pan, and I like to take my spatula and kind of poke holes into the thick egg whites. I don't know if this actually does anything, but I enjoy doing it. Take your spatula and scrape up that slippery little egg and give it a careful flip. I'm going for a really runny yolk in mine, so I'm only going to cook these for two to three minutes. Once they're all cooked up, let's grab another pan and plop in one pound of breakfast sausage. I have this pan over medium high heat for the record. Start breaking it up with a spatula and optionally add in two teaspoons of hot sauce. I only did this since I already have a spicy base, so don't feel obligated, but it is really tasty. I also went ahead and added a preemptive half teaspoon of black pepper. Once the sausage is broken up and cooked all the way through, remove half of it and set aside. Now we want to make our sausage gravy by adding in a half pint of heavy cream and two ounces of cream cheese. Bring this to a boil and reduce the heat to medium. I went ahead and added an additional two teaspoons of hot sauce just because I'm feeling muy caliente. Stir this until thickened. 
I like to be able to see that creamy river part when my spatula goes through it. Taste it and hit it with a little more black pepper if you feel like it needs more. Okay, all the components are finally done. I greased down an 8x11 baking dish with unsalted butter. I probably should have went a touch heavier just because things did stick, but a little scraping of the spatula did help to get the food out. It's not like it was permanently stuck. Speaking of scraping, scrape out your pork rye mixture and spread evenly. Place this into an oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 minutes just to give it a little par bake. While that's in, let's tend to our bacon. I was worried that if I left the bacon in full strips, it'd be hard to cut through. So I cut mine into quarter sections. It worked out like I wanted it to. All right, so once the crust has been par-baked, use some uncorrupted footage to prove that you've put on about three quarters of your sausage gravy. I follow this up by layering on my fried eggs, then the bacon. Since this obviously wasn't gonna be good enough as it is, I decided to shred over about three ounces of smoked cheddar. And finally, I finished up with my reserve breakfast sausage. Place this back into your still hot oven for 15 to 20 minutes or until the cheese is slightly browned. Here's some chive slicing ASMR for you. All right, the timer's up. Pull this opulent thing out and feel free to go ahead and dig in if you want your face to melt off, but I highly suggest you let this cool for about 10 minutes. You should be able to get about nine normal servings or five large servings from this thing. Now, I know this isn't the fanciest thing I've ever made, but I'm probably more excited about this than I should be. Let's take a bite real quick. Here, you can see the look of surprise as to how good this was. Feel free to send me your surprise faces on Instagram if you make this. To start this one, I'm going to show you how Chef John from Food Wishes taught me to boil eggs. Grab yourself a pot or a pan and add in about one inch of water. Place the pan over high heat and bring it to a hard boil. Once it's boiling, carefully place your eggs in. If you drop one in and it starts to get a little too excited, pull it out real quick and replace it with another less cheerful egg. You can cover this with a lid if you have one, but I don't, so I just used another pan. You want to steam this for about 12 minutes. Let's set up a nice bath for their after sauna session. This is what's called shocking the eggs and it lets them know that they're about to be eaten without actually having to say it. Now that we have existential eggs, we need to get some bacon, preferably pancetta, and cut it into lardon. Now that you've got a solid lardon, show it off by throwing it into a pan over medium high heat along with about a quarter cup of water. We add the water because this will allow for maximum extraction of bacon grease. While we're at it, add in about a half teaspoon of coarse ground black pepper. I enjoy a really peppery carbonara, so feel free to reduce the pepper content if you want. This time, I suggest that you cook your bacon until crispy. We'll be blending it up later and want it to stand out with its texture. The cooked components are done, so we can work on some assembly. Let's crack those eggs open. I like to crack the egg all the way around, on top, and on the bottom. I'm not sure if it's from being steamed or how I crack the eggs, but the shells strip away about 67% all the time. Looky here, perfect. Here's a closer look for those that need it. Here's an even closer look so that you can see the pores of the egg. Honestly, I'm impressed that I peeled that with one hand. So I'm gonna make these almost like I'd make an actual carbonara by emulsifying egg yolks and cheese. Please follow my words and written recipe as I went buck wild in the video section of this with my portion sizes. To blend, you'll want to add in three egg yolks, half your cooked bacon, one ounce of grated Parmesan cheese, and three tablespoons of bacon grease that is still relatively warm. Oh, almost forgot to get the other egg yolks in there. Add all of your boiled egg yolks. Put this into a blender and blend on low until everything is smooth and homogenous. In the recipe below, I'll be sure to give you measurements for a 12 pack of eggs. After it's blended, taste for salt and pepper and adjust as you see fit. Mine was perfect. Scoop this out into a piping bag or a Ziploc bag that badly wants to be a piping bag when it grows up. Cut the tip off and pipe in your mixture. You can go pretty tall with these because there's plenty of extras in the yolk mixture. Top this with the rest of your crispy bacon and finish it off with some freshly cracked black pepper. And there it is, carbonara in side dish form. You could definitely cream this out with some cream cheese if you want. And if you find yourself with way too thick of an egg mixture, add a little splash of heavy cream because that goes a long way. Okay, whenever you go buy a beef tenderloin at the store, it's going to come in a big package like this. All you're going to need is a cutting board and preferably a boning or some sort of fillet knife. Let's start off with the chain. Once you have our tenderloin out of the package, let's grab some paper towels and dry it off pretty well. If you look here, there's a big seam that you can actually put your fingers in between. 
If you can't feel it, just cut the silver skin that's attaching it, but honestly, you can almost pull the entire chain off without even having to cut it. There's probably one quarter of it that you need to cut. Now, this is actually still usable meat. It's just got a lot of silver skin and connective tissue in between it. Just don't toss it. It's got plenty of mileage left on it. Next up is the head. The head is attached to the loin across from the chain. It's just not actually attached to the chain as well, but separated by fat and sinew. Just like the chain, you're going to look for some seams under the body of the tenderloin and start to separate. If you flip the whole thing around, you can get a pretty good idea of where you need to start cutting. So just pick it up and start slicing through like so. I like to go through until I get to the very edge of the silver skin and leave most of that on the loin. Now we can clean this thing up. There's really not a whole lot to say about how to clean the head of a beef tenderloin. There's a few areas with silver skin and you'll lose some meat because of them, but that still doesn't mean you should throw away that meat. You can still clean that up and save it for your dogs. But what I like to start with is just pulling off any loose fat that you can feed to the raccoons. The biggest piece of silver skin is right here and it actually goes through another piece of the meat which you'll likely lose, but you can feed that to the cats later. I don't want to spend too much time talking about how to clean the head because it honestly doesn't feel like it matters as much as the loin section. But with that said, you can use this for more fillets or putting it in your grandmother's chair. I did end up with three nice sized steaks, however. Now we can focus on the loin. This is where we get our filet mignon. I like to start off with the silver skin. All you're going to do is cut under at the edge of the tail and then cut across with your knife while putting pressure up against it and slicing through. I didn't put quite enough pressure on mine and lost some of the meat. Or you can do it this way, which is cut out a flat piece, pull it up, and scrape down the meat. This is what I usually end up doing. The only thing is I left with these little ridges, but you could just push those down. I also like to remove about an inch or so of the tail ends. They never really work out into a steak, but are excellent scraps to feed your cow. On the opposite of this tail end is a big section of silver skin with some meat still attached to it. In my experience, this isn't always here, but it almost always feels like a second part of the chain. It's still usable meat, but it won't work in my fillets. So I usually just cut it off and save it with a chain. Just continue pulling off any loose fat that you may see on here and looking for more silver skin. Like here's a little piece that gets hidden sometimes and that just happened to be sticking out. So I noticed it and removed it. It is a pretty thick piece. So if you see this sticking out, go ahead and get it out of there. I try not to cut the fat sections off where the ribs were, but sometimes there's just some unavoidable silver there, so I cut some of it off. I try to leave as much as possible because it's such a lean meat that every little bit of fat helps add flavor to it. I'm shooting for six ounce portions. You can cut yours into whatever you want, obviously. So to butterfly the first one, just cut off a section at the end, cut a third of the way through the steak on the thicker side to at least three quarters of the way through the entire steak. Then fold it and round it out. After that one, we could continue with our steaks until I get to the other side, and I'll usually have to butterfly it as well. On occasion, like this one, I ended up with a little bit of excess at the end that I will add to my scrap pile. Don't forget that this is all perfectly good meat that you can use to power a rocket. So, out of a 7 pound-ish beef tenderloin, I was able to get 13 6 to 7 ounce steaks with about 1.5 pounds of scraps. Not bad. Hey there, my meaty friends. This is Reed, aka Carnivore Chef, aka Rebimus Prime. I've been wanting to do a prime rib video for a while now, and I'm happy to finally be doing this. This is just a technique that takes ribeye to a different level. It's super simple to make and makes the best leftovers if you have any left. I make this beast with homemade blackened seasoning, but feel free to go as simple as you want. I'm lucky to have access to full ribeye loins in the restaurant. This gives me full control of how big I want my prime rib to be. I'm shooting for three pounds. Well, I'll make that four pounds. Since I'm only using this piece of the loin, I'm going to help the grill cook out and get some of her prep done by cutting steaks. And just like that, 11 12 ounce steaks left. The first step we want to do for this beauty is to pat it dry with paper towels. Being in the cryovac packaging helps the blood cling on pretty well, so we just want to get rid of that. Oh shit, I forgot to preheat the oven. Frantically go over to your oven and turn it to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have a convection oven, that's awesome. I'll leave details on how to cook this in a convection and conventional oven. Since we're now waiting on our oven to preheat, let's make this blackened seasoning. Let's grab some smoked paprika, three tablespoons worth. Some granulated garlic, one tablespoon worth. Some granulated onion, one tablespoon worth. Some hand pepper, two teaspoons worth. Some dried thyme, one teaspoon worth. Some cayenne, one teaspoon worth. And finally, the best salt on earth in the form of one tablespoon. Come in like Patrick Swayze and give this a passionate forking. If you don't have a hotel pan, grab a deep baking dish. Place down a wire rack and then your ribeye roast on it. Now all you're gonna wanna do here is heavily season on all sides. Take your time and use as much of the seasoning as it needs. I probably use three quarters of my recipe. 
If you're just using salt, you'll likely feel like you're using a grotesque amount. That's fine because it needs it. Place this into your oven for about 20 minutes per pound if using a convection oven. If using a conventional oven, I'd go about 23 to 25 minutes per pound. Either way, once your time is up, let this rest in the oven turned off for about 30 minutes. Once it's out of the oven, give it a poke in admiration. I was shooting for mine to be about 128 degrees in the center, but I unfortunately ran out of time. I also was only able to let this rest for about 10 minutes before having to get slicing. So it's still a bit raw in the very middle. I'm not bothered by it personally, but you may be. Anyways, slice this up into about half inch slices and serve it up. I purposely didn't do any sauces because I was already short on time. Feel free to use some au jus or horseradish sauce if you want. Let's take this first bite, which is from my Patreon community. If you're interested in joining, the link is in the description. This blackened seasoning turned out pretty fire. Not just because it's spicy, but because it complements the fattiness of the ribeye. I could sit here and try to eat this whole thing, but I've really got to get going. 